But when it comes to our connection with God, when it comes to our spiritual life, especially what we should do and not do, a lot of us would like God just to send us a sign. Whether we are making decisions about who to date, who to marry, what kind of job we should take, what's going on, we really do wish that God would just come down and go, here's your sign. Here's your sign. Here's your sign. Now notice it doesn't say I'm stupid. It just says, here's your sign. We want a sign from God as we go through certain things in our life. We want the reasons, we want the signs for confirmation. Like, we want this idea, okay, God, here's what I think I need to do. Here's what I want to do. But I want you to give me the thumbs up on what I'm about to do. So we want a sign for confirmation. We want a sign to convince us that God is there. Sometimes, if we're really not connected with the Lord, we're really not walking the way we should, we don't feel His presence. And when we don't feel His presence, we doubt. We doubt everything that's going on. So what we want is we want a sign from God so we know that He is there. Or, outside of confirmation, outside of convincing, maybe we just want a sign from God or not get a sign from God so it excuses our doubt. It's okay. Since we didn't get a sign from God and we don't feel His presence, we can be excused from even going about His way. But when it comes to us, what should we do with this idea of a sign? Should we pray for one? Should we look for one? When we see one, should we follow it? Should we ignore it? How should our perception be if we are followers of Jesus when it comes to to signs in this world. We're in our cover to cover series where we're surveying each book of the Bible, going through the 14 narrative movements. We started in the book of Genesis. And as we've been going through each book of the Bible, we've been highlighting the key words or key phrases so we know what's going on in each book. In Genesis, there are eight words that get us through the book. Creation, fall, flood, tower, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. So when somebody asks you, hey, do you know what the book of Genesis is about? You say those eight words. From Genesis, we move to Exodus. There's three words that get us through the book of Exodus. Exodus, law, and tabernacle. Exodus, law, and tabernacle. Leviticus, there's two words that get us through the book of Leviticus. Sacrifice and sanctification. Or you might use the word separation. The separation is just a little bit more. The uh, book of Numbers, three phrases. Old generation. The wandering generation, where the old generation dies off, and then the new generation. The book of Deuteronomy may be my favorite. Two phrases that get us through the book of Deuteronomy. Moses preaches, Moses died. The book of Joshua, they go into the land. They win the land, and then they start to live in the land. And we're in the book of Judges. And in the book of Judges, we have one phrase in five words. The one phrase that gets us through the book of Judges is cycles of sin. We're going to see this same storyline over and over and over again as we go through the book of Judges. What is that cycle? Sin, slavery, supplication, savior, stability, and then we repeat it. As we've been in the book of Judges, we've looked at Caleb, the last man standing in the Bible, the last dude who come out of Egypt. He doesn't die until the book of Judges. We look at his son-in-law, Othanel. We looked at Ehud. We looked at Shamgar, one of the favorite ones. Shamgar only gives us one verse, but there's a lot in that one verse. We have Deborah. Last week, we started to look at Gideon. And we said our lesson for the book of Gideon as we begin his life is when God looks at us, he doesn't see us for where we are. He sees us for what we can become. God sees our potential. Our, God sees our potential, which is meaningful. We continue our story in Gideon today. Chapter 6, verse 33 says, Now, the Midianites, the Amalekites, and other eastern peoples joined forces and crossed over the Jordan and camped in the valley of Jezreel. So here's what's going on. Israel has been in the land for a little bit of time. They've been winning. They've got a great reputation. But other nations are scared of Israel. Israel has taken down most of the powerful people at this moment in time. And now all coming together. Hey, we can't let them keep their momentum. We have to go in and we have to stop them. The only way we can stop them is come together and fight. Verses 34 and 35. 
The Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon. This is the same dude who last week, he was threshing wheat in a wine press, hiding the food from everybody because he did not want the Midianites to come take it. He was scared. He didn't know his potential. And God comes up and says, Hello, Gideon, mighty warrior. And then Gideon goes, Who me? And then we take us through the process of the calling of Gideon last week where God, Gideon and God comes face to face. Gideon, you have great potential. The Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon. He blew a trumpet, summoning the Abyssites to follow him. He sent messengers throughout Manasseh, calling them to arms, and also into Asher, Zebulun, Naphtali, so that they too went up to meet them. Now pause for a second. Okay, pause for a second. So after getting this call, he knows that a bunch of other nations are coming to him. The Spirit of the Lord came on him. The Spirit of God came on him in a powerful way. You know, whenever the Spirit of God comes on us, he comes on us in a powerful way. When does it happen? It happens when we believe in the gospel. When we believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. That he was buried, that he rose on the third day, that he was seen, that he ascended to heaven, he sat down as king of the universe, and one day he is coming back. When we believe in Jesus as our Savior, when we base forgiveness for our sins based on his blood, when we trust in Jesus alone to get us there, the Spirit of God comes on us in a powerful way, and it changes us. It changes us. If it doesn't change you, you're not doing something right. He comes on us in a powerful way. And when you look at your life and you compare your pre-Jesus to your post-Jesus, there should be a difference. There should be a difference. People, whenever I talk, especially about kids, like they're blown away with some of my story. Like they, they, people think that I had been going to church all my life. I did not attending, start attending all over until I was 20. I did not go to Sunday school. I only went to two BBSs. I didn't go to church camp. I, I didn't go to youth group. None of that was, was part of my world until I was 20. I did not take a public speaking course in high school or college. In college, I think I only gave one presentation. I did not take public speaking until I went to grad school. And that was after, that was the, the post-Jesus. The first book I ever read cover to cover was the Bible. In high school and even in college, I lived off cliff notes. The first book I ever read cover to cover was the Bible, and I did it in 47 days. Okay? There should be a change in you when the Spirit of God comes on you. You compare your pre-Jesus to your post-Jesus, and it should be different. Gideon is hiding in a wine press, scared of the Midianites. God comes to him and says, hey, you can be a great warrior. I'm going to use you to beat the Midianites. The Spirit of the Lord comes on him, and he calls for people. He calls for him. But notice Manasseh, Asher, Zebulun, Naphtali. That's all the cousins. That's part of his family. He goes, hey, I'm getting ready to fight, and I need my family with me now. Now, they're cousins. They're distant, but they're also nations. They're tribes. But he's calling his people together to get ready for a fight. Now, let's look at this word, uh, Come on, came on. The Hebrew word is lahash. Next slide. It means to dress, to wear, to clothe, to be clothed, to put on, to cover. To cover, to put on. I like all those different words. Probably the key word in this passage. But you just think of it. Like you've got something to do. Like you have like this Clark Kent moment. <laughs> And you might want to turn into Superman. So you put on your cape or not. And then once you do, once you get there, you're like, yes, I am now ready to fight because I am clothed in the way I am supposed to be clothed in. This is the way we're supposed to feel when the Spirit of God is in us and we're going out to fight spiritual battles or even battles in our life. The Spirit of the Lord is kind of like Popeye and spinach. <coughs> so, so when you really lean in 
when you really lean in to the power of God, it should puff you up in a spiritual way so you can fight whatever battles God is throwing at you. Then you have to come to grips with it. And that's what Gideon has to do. Verses 36 and 37. Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have promised, look, I will place a wolf fleece on the threshing floor. There's some irony there. You know where his story was supposed to start? On the threshing floor. That's where his story was supposed to start, but he wasn't there. He was in a wine press. So we've come full circle in the story of Gideon. This is where he should have been when he was threshing the wheat. If there is dew only on the fleece and all the ground is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand as you said. And we look at this and we're like, okay, is he doubting? Is he having any weak faith? Yes, he is. Is he asking for a sign? Yes, he is, but it's funny. Even though it's a weak faith, even though it's doubt, even though he's asking for a sign, God never slaps him or <clears throat> yells at him for doing so. There's never a moment in Gideon's life where God says, you shouldn't have done that. In the disciples' life, whenever they want a sign, whenever they want to you know, have weak moments, God calls them out on it. Oh, you of little faith. Even don't ask for a sign. Because if you don't believe this in Luke 16, he says, if you don't believe the Moses and the prophets and the law of God, even if someone came back from the dead, you're not going to believe that the sign's not strong enough. But in this moment in time, he's not going to yell at Gideon. It's a little different than the signs we want. You know, we're wanting signs for direction in life. We're wanting signs for decision making, whether it's romantic, whether it's job, whether it's a move. He's about to fight an army. He's about to put his life on the line to fight for God's people. There's a different dynamic going on when he asks for this sign. And he goes, okay, God, I know you've told me that, that, that I'm a mighty warrior. I'm not fully convinced yet. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put a fleece down. And what I want you to do, if you're really going to have my back, if you're really going to confirm me as your mighty warrior, in the morning, I want the fleece to be wet. And it says he wants dew on it. Now, back in the day, the way Israel thought about dew, and this is probably related to their wandering years in the wilderness as they're going, in their wandering years, one way God provided for Israel was dew would come on the ground, the dew would crust over. We ended up calling it manna. That's what they called it. They called it manna. It was flakes like frost or the original cereal, frosted flakes. So, and after that moment in time, after the frosted flakes, after the manna in the wilderness, they viewed dew as a blessing from God. So what he is asking is for God to bless what's going on. Are you going to bless me as your mighty warrior? Are you going to bless me as the commander of your army? So let it be dewish, damp. Let all the ground be dry. What happens? Verse 38. And that is what happened. Gideon rose early the next day. He squeezed the fleece and wrung out the dew, a bowl full of water. Now, when I look at that, I don't necessarily think about dew. I think about soaking wet. I think part of that is just a long blessing. He's going, you will be blessed. But notice something again. He never gets said, you shouldn't have done that. There's never a gift slap. There's never a hand slap. He's never condemned for the doubt or even asking for a sign. Why? Because it's not about the sign, it's about the search. It's not about the sign, it's about the search for God's will, for God's plan. And that's what Gideon needed confirmation on. He needed confirmation in the plan and the will of God. And he was searching for it, and we need to search for it too. Regardless of signs, regardless of signs. There was this guy, 
He was kind of the manager. He was the overseer of an office. And nobody would listen to him. So he went out and he bought a sign that said, I'm the boss. He stuck it on his office door and he even drew attention to it. He goes, okay, everybody, look at the sign. You need to know that I am the boss. He goes to lunch. He comes back and when he gets to his office, the sign is gone. And he is absolutely livid because somebody took his sign. So he goes and yells at him, okay, what happened to my sign? And one guy, he stands up and he goes, sir, your wife called and she wanted her sign back. <laughs> we have to be careful of the signs we go after. Gideon keeps going, verses 39. Then Gideon said to God, do not be angry with me. Like, what that too? God, we need a sign. We want this. We need direction. Give me another sign, another sign, another sign. We keep asking for more and more and more. He's doing it too. And he goes, let me make just one more request. Allow me one more test with the fleece. But this time, make the fleece dry and let the ground be covered with dew. That night, God did so. Only the fleece was dry. All the ground was covered with the dew. So this time, it's out here. I get amused with this one. Because <coughs> I'm like, okay, whenever he wanted the fleece to be dewful or damp, he got up the next morning and was like, shh, shh, shh. Like, it was a whole bowl full of water. That's how much blessing was coming. I wonder if he did the same with the ground. <laughs> I mean, is it one of those things where he goes, okay, I want the place to be dry, but the entire ground to be wet. So he gets up in the morning, he goes, oh, I see it, let's go see. <clears throat> he has like a, a knee full of mud that he kind of walks in and he has to really kind of struggle to get there overall. Again, God's not going to yell at him. He just gives him the sign. Why? Because it's not about the sign, it's about the search for God's will. It's not about the sign. It's about the search for God's will and the path that he has for us. There was this man who absolutely loved cheesecake. That was his favorite dessert. But he's been on a pretty strict diet, so he's kind of been holding off on the cheesecake. And one day he was about to go home, and he knew he was going to go past his favorite cheesecake factory. And he's like, man, I really think I want to stop and take a cheesecake home, but he wasn't too sure. So he called his wife and he goes, what do you think? And the wife goes, I think you should just pray about it, especially since you're trying to lose all this weight. So he's driving, he's getting very close, and he goes, okay, God, if you want me to buy a cheesecake today, let me drive into the parking lot and let there be an open parking spot very close. So he drives in, he sees the open parking spot, he pulls in, he goes, and he buys his cheesecake, he takes it home, and he walks into the house, and he just has a huge smile on his face. And the wife goes, huh, well, what did exactly did you pray for? He prayed, well, I prayed that if God wanted us to have cheesecake tonight, if he wanted me to buy this cheesecake, there would be an open parking space in the parking lot, and there was. The wife smiled, she realized, well, how many loops did you have to make in the parking lot? And he goes, 16. <laughs> Sometimes we force the issue when we're looking for a sign from God. But in this moment, this is exactly what Gideon needed. From a narrative standpoint, it's taken from verse 11 to verse 39 to get there, but Gideon finally is ready to be the general of the Lord's army. He's finally ready. It took 11 to 39 from the wine press to the threshing floor to all the deals with the fleece, but now he knows what he's supposed to do. And the Bible always gives him a thumbs up. Even though he prayed for a sign, why? Because it's not about the sign, it's about the search for God's will. It's not about the sign, it's about the search for God's will. So what do we need to do? 
in terms of our prayers and look for. Number one, we need to observe. <coughs> observe the normal details. Observe the stuff that's going on in our life. What's going on in other people's life and us. So maybe we can get a hint of what we need to do. Being careful of the signs. You see, last night, I walked into Food Line. And if you go into Food Line and you look to the east, they're going to have like this sign right here. This is Pinatas, 1999. I looked at that last night and read it. And the first thing that popped into my mind was, that's not a piñata, that's apples. <laughs> <laughs> I looked in the wrong direction. I looked down, I didn't look up. Even when God gives us signs, we can misinterpret the signs. So we have to be very detailed in what we are looking for. So observe the details. Obey. 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 God has told us his plan. We are supposed to pray. We're supposed to have certain spiritual disciplines. We're supposed to tell people about Jesus. We're supposed to look for the second coming of Jesus. We're supposed to build up the local body of Christ. And if we're not doing that, we're not following his will. So if we're not doing it from a spiritual standpoint, why do you think he's going to do it in your personal life? He's not. Because you're not following his plan anyway. So we have to obey the way he has called us to do. And then open. So we're observing, we are obeying, and then we're opening up and open our mouths. Open our mouths and pray for specifics. My number one thing with signs is always to pray for specifics, not for a sign. Be very detailed and let the way God handles your prayer direct you. The answers to prayer with a yes or the answers to prayer with a no. Be very specific in your prayer life and let those prayers and the way he handles those be your direction. But you have to observe, you have to obey, and you have to open your mouth and be specific. There was this guy, he was looking for a job and he looked and he found something that said, okay, we want to be a Morris Code operator. A Morris Code operator. So he goes in and he sits down, he gets the paperwork, he starts filling out the paperwork. And he notices there are like 39 other people in this room waiting to be interviewed for this Morris Code job. But nothing is happening. And all of a sudden he just kind of stops and he listens. And he hears this in the background. And he starts to listen. He starts to contemplate. He starts to interpret. Then he gets up and he goes into the office. Right after that, the guy who's overseeing everything, he says, okay, all of you can go home. The position has been filled. And everybody's kind of getting all upset going, well, wait a minute. We didn't get the paperwork turned in. We didn't get an interview. And the guy says, well, as you've all been sitting here, there was Morris code going off in the background. And it said, if you understand this, go into the office. You have the job. Only one dude understood it and got it. Only one of them got the sign right. Another reason we have to be careful when we pray for signs because we might get it wrong. Part of the Gideon story is a warning. It's a warning about your faith and how serious a lack of faith can be. How serious lack of obedience can be when you're not following the Israelites, because of their lack of obedience, goes through a cycle. Goes through a cycle. Goes through a cycle. Whenever we're messed up and we're not behaving the way we're supposed to, we go through a cycle. We go through a cycle. We go through a cycle. We can stop the cycle with our faithfulness to the Lord. We can stop the cycle when Jesus eventually does come back. And that's what we should do. Father, we pray that as we process signs, as we process our prayers, we pray that the Spirit of God would come on us, would fill us with the power to open our eyes to observe, would open our hearts and our souls to obey, would open our mouths so we can pray specifically. So when we encounter signs, when we encounter details, when we encounter the path that you want us to go on, we can choose the direction you have called us to follow. 
We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.